Um, okay, Bertrand, I pretty much butchered your intro. I didn't mention that you <laughs> that you were the CEO and director of Step Up Consulting, um, and that you're also a black belt in Six Sigma. So my apologies for that. Uh, <laughs> we've got a lot to cover today, so thank you for coming on the show. Thank you very much, uh, Jared, for uh, having me here at the Crownsman uh, Partners uh, show. Uh, my name now, and uh, I, I'm really uh, excited to be here. Well, we've we certainly got a lot to cover. I'm going to cover something just completely for personal selfish reasons. I noticed on your on LinkedIn it says you're the first board university chess team national. So you're yeah. a chess player. I am a chess player. I uh, I play. Uh, amateur but i was uh part of the dominican team and i play in a in a couple of olympiads student olympiads and international tournament tournaments all over the place so <laughs> nowadays it's a very uh very handy skill it makes you a little bit more strategic and yeah uh, loving tactics making sure that you can get things accomplished it's, it's a great game. I play it very, very poorly. Um, but in all fairness, I've just started to really learn it the last few months. So I noticed that you were on there. You might have to teach me a few things. <laughs> It'll be my pleasure. Um, uh, don't say that too quick. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. That was, that was my first job. I was a chess teacher for, for a while at the military school. Really? I don't have my resume anymore. But <laughs> That's really interesting. Uh, so you, you played a lot of chess then. I did. I, uh, but after I married, you know, with professions and children in the way, uh, it was kind of hard because chess is uh, is is worse than uh, than a family. <laughs> it takes out of you everything. You have to give it everything to be really good. Yeah. Well, I thought there's a quote from Einstein. It's like it something about that. It takes over. It takes over the mind. And if Einstein's saying that, you better look out playing that game. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, okay, uh, Bertrand, we, uh, you have, you've done so much in the industry. So it's, you know, I'm, I guess I'm going to, I think I'm going to start with the Six Sigma because you said it, you're approaching it from a corporate responsibility side. And I've always thought of Six Sigma um, because of, I have a limited knowledge about it. I always thought of it as a manufacturing tool. So how are you applying it in, in your, in your, uh, in your application? Well, um, it's uh, it's really simple. Uh, it's just uh, making sure that you can think a little bit out of the box, uh, and uh, because both manufacturing, production, mining, are processes, and the corporate social responsibility is also a process with a with a lot of steps, results, inputs, and what you do is you apply the Six Sigma technology to make sure that you master that process and you understand very clearly what the customer wants. And your customer are usually your stakeholders. And you need to understand what are they looking for? What, what are they after? What do they need? Uh, it's the same as in the organization. If you are, let's say in the mine and you have to give some product to, to the mill, you have to understand what your customer wants. And in um, communities and corporate social responsibility, you have to look at your stakeholders and analyze what do they require? What is important for them to be part of this process and make sure that they are engaged and they are really a part of it. The, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to ask this question. I think you'll have an easier time answering, but. For me, if I picture now, like let, let's say a mine is going into a community. Now, is your approach saying that there is a step-by-step -step process? And I will loop it back. Um, it wasn't completely selfish for using the chess example, or, or <laughs> if you know you play chess. But right. yes, there's a strategy, um, but there's also the the shift of focus can completely change each game depending on how your opponent plays. So when you're going into a community, is there are, is Six Sigma to the point where you've got a hundred uh, step checklist that you're doing, or is it a mindset? Uh, sort of, can you unpack what it is um, using the example if a mine is going into a community? Yes, uh, absolutely. And uh, you know, it's a it's a long 
process. Mining is a very long term process and it takes a lot of steps, not necessarily a lot of very little steps, but some uh, a, a set of steps, you know, that you have to accomplish. And uh, for instance, uh, I can tell you about the, uh, my, uh, my time when I was working for Falconbridge and uh, Falconbridge uh, went into a joint venture with BHP to um, operate the Gag Island Nickel Project. It was in a remote island in, uh, in Indonesia, in the Sorong province. And there was about 840 people living in that community. And that community was sitting right on top of the, uh, the mineral deposit. So imagine all the, the challenges for going and trying to exploit that uh, that resources. So I, I learned a very important lesson from Falconbridge. And the first thing they did is they sent the uh, environmental specialist and the human resources and community specialist, which was me in that time. So we were the first two people that uh, planted uh, uh, food in that, in that island and start understanding the community, their issues, what was important for them, their traditions. It, there was a lot of complications. Uh, they were uh, 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 a Muslim community sitting in a Christian uh, region to start out. There was malaria that was prevalent in the, in the island. So there was all kinds of issues. So what we had to do first is understand what the community was, what they were requiring, what are their needs, and uh, how we can start building a partnership with that community in order to be able to, in 20 years, exploit that uh, mineral resource. So that's a, that's a little example of how you can start, you know, looking at your stakeholders to understand what are their needs. And, uh, you know, I, I, nowadays, I use uh, all kinds of tools, like the House of Quality, which is a very interesting uh, tool that permits you to rank uh, in order what are the, uh, the key uh, needs or requirement of the, of the stakeholders. So it's either, and we people, we have the same needs all over the place. It doesn't matter if you are in, 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 at the end of the world or if you are in New York City, you know, your needs are the same. You need to be healthy. You need to to uh, have food. You need to have friends. All these kind of things. So you know, it's like the Maslow hierarchy of needs. You start with safety. You need to be safety. You need to feel secure, and then you go, you know, go go on self esteem, self realization, going up on the pyramid to right. the, uh, all the things that you need. Right. So, and I, again, I, I think you are unpacking my question. Is that so when you come into that now, those how long ago was that where you went uh, into Indonesia? That was uh, in two thousand. In two thousand, so 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 not so long ago, but you, yeah. you obviously had a lot of experiences since then. Is that did you bring did you bring specific tools there, like uh, you know driving a car? It's like you know how to, you get trained at first, you learn how to do it, but then you just do it without thinking of it. You know, you put the brakes on, you just know when to do it. When you go in there, or do you come in with a with a playbook going, okay, I need this list of needs that they have. Um, I need to talk to people from this, from these different sort of, um, that have this sort of influence on the community. Like, is there an actual playbook um, that ties in with Six Sigma and the psychology of it and all that? I'm just, I'm just trying to understand that. Yes, indeed. There's a, there's a, a very interesting, uh, let's say, uh, playbook, and uh, I I won't explain it today uh, because uh, that's going to be part of one of my presentations at the uh, CIM conference in Montreal in May. Uh, you know, it's going to be virtual, but uh, perfect. So, in that uh, presentation, I'm going to explain step by step all the all the playbook. But I can tell you one of the first uh, steps of the of the play playbook is. Uh, looking at the community, the, the stakeholder analysis, okay? Stakeholder matrix, the house of quality. So it's, there are some specific tools that we have learned to use to understand better people. But that being said, nothing replaces 
the human touch, meaning the connection that you have to establish between you as the representative of the money and the community. So if you don't have empathy, if you don't have love for mankind <laughs> or for, uh, for your, uh, your peers, your, uh, your, your uh, other people, then you know nothing works. You think you, you mentioned that, uh, you know, and I, I talked to you off, off air and you, you said, you know, basically we're OK with with, you know, me sort of expanding on my questions. And do you think that you need to have empathy to be able to go into a community? You said it was a Muslim community um, in Indonesia. Do you think you need to have some sort of deep connection to that? to that culture, into that religion, into that region? Or can you go in there as a complete outsider and still connect with that community? I think you can go as a complete outsider and still have a connection with that because you have the key element and is uh, the like for your humankind people. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, a, a love for people, you know, and you understand people, you're going to be able to connect no matter what your religion, no matter what your culture, no matter what your upbringing, because you have the, the, the base uh, avenue to, to reach that person. Yeah, I would love to be a fly on a wall in, in one day if you're ever going to those communities. <laughs> Some, somehow let me tag along. Um, it, Bertrand, we're going to talk uh, later on the show, we're going to talk about, um, you know, the psychology of what people are going through working from home. Um, you mentioned your presentation that you're going to be doing at CIM. I, I really hope people take time to spend those few days because there is the some of the presenters that they've got set up for that is just it's going to be absolutely the amount of knowledge is going to be unbelievable. Um, but sticking with this for a moment, are there some examples of um, you know, and I, and I don't, it's not that I want to pick on anybody, but I, I think it's important. Are there examples of companies who have done it well? Um, you just mentioned you were working when you went into Indonesia and companies that have, have dropped the ball when it comes to that corporate, you know, and that social responsibility of coming in and, and not just from a, you know, not from the news statement, oh, they failed. Right, right. I, I mean, more from the process side where they just missed, they just approached it wrong. And, and it could have been done different. Is there anything that you could sort of set up for us? Yep, uh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, uh, by mentioning some uh, mining name is not, uh, let's say, uh, interested in any, any way. It's just part of the examples I lead in my career in mining. As I mentioned, I started with, with Falconbridge, uh, that uh, Canadian uh, mining powerhouse of the uh, 80s and 90s and uh, uh, they really had a really good way and they had a couple of minds that are uh, a remarkable example of doing things right. One of them is the, uh, the Raglan mine in Northern Quebec in the Inuit region. And, and uh, not only all the technological challenges of having a a camp and a mine in a in an Arctic zone, <laughs> but you know to be able to get in there and understand the the Inuit community and uh, understand the culture and being able to put together a uh, a mining operation, uh, being fully staffed uh, or mainly staffed by by uh, the Inuit people, so. That was really is a, is a very good example. I think it was the first one that we use, and uh, we we use a lot of the model uh, of Raglan, all the uh, uh, the respect for the culture, the understanding of the people and stuff. So um, I think that was a, a fantastic experience, and that experience was replicated uh, in New Caledonia. Which is, you know, in the in the Pacific out there, um, uh, close to New Zealand, uh, and uh, and New Caledonia, they they pull a, a mining project, you know, against all odds, 
And one of the things that they did, and they, you know, thinking out of the box, and that's very important in uh, in, in community uh, development and understanding and getting the the support of the community, um, is that you have to think out of the box and understand those needs and go beyond what is, uh, let's say, the norm. And the thing that Pop and Bridge did that allowed that uh, uh, operation to go was they were able to give a 51% stake on the operation. Something that usually a mining company doesn't do. You want to make sure that you have control and that you got, you know, the majority and that stuff. And sometimes that's what kills the private. Yeah. Okay. So that was a very interesting one. And uh, well, New Caledonia, the Coniambo project was, uh, was a big challenge, a huge challenge technologically, and Falcon Bridge brought a lot of innovation there. They brought some technologies from the cement industry into mining to, to create that. And, you know, it, it has been a, like a hit and miss, but it has been operating ever since uh, uh, in the early 2000s, and uh, it's still uh, operating successfully, uh, managed now by Glencore. It was managed by Extrata after Falconbridge and then uh, Glencore. And it's a very good uh, project. It has a lot of uh, even environmental uh, uh, challenges because uh, the lagoon in New Caledonia has one of the most pristine uh, corals in the whole Pacific, similar to the Raja Ampat where Gag Island was. And you know, that project, the Gag Island project never happened because there was no space where to put the tailings. Uh, and the option for that was deep sea tailings, which was something that at that time was possible, but really looking forward from there, it was not viable mm -hmm. because deep sea tailing was a very controversial methodology. I can and see both BHP and, uh, and Falcon Bridge preferred to shelve the project, although there was other other issues like uh, BHP got together with Billington and uh, the, the Hawking Bridge was not so important for what they wanted. But, you know, the project never went. Uh, Indonesia declared uh, a protected forestry. And after that, uh, they, the interest was lost in, in the project because, you know, cost-wise, it will have been almost impossible to bring it to, to production. You you have um you have because if you're working for you know a company and then you're going into a community you're essentially you're trying to uh build this relationship with the community and bridge those gaps get an agreement and ultimately the goal for you is to get the mine um to operating that's, that's yeah, what exactly. the company you yeah. to do but you're do you find have you found it in your career and are there examples where you're going through that process but you have you felt that the mine that has brought you into that location is approaching it wrong and it, it's the, really you're, you're sort of it hasn't got the result you want because their their approach isn't right oh absolutely <laughs> and uh you, you you mentioned that we were going to be talking about some stories and there's some stories that i can i can tell and it it cost me my jobs a couple of times it's, uh, you know, and, and I, I'm proud to say it, that uh, because you know what? You don't have to be in agreement 100% with top management and uh, you have to understand and you have to tell them uh, what it is. And I, I wrote a paper in 2012. It's a very little paper. It's one page. It, it's, uh, it's called about practical ways to improve relations with the community to fulfill your social responsibility. Any, uh, you know, I think I provided you the uh, the link, and if not, I can I give it to you. But you know, if you follow those steps, uh, you can make absolutely uh, sure that uh, you're going to get the support of the community, and you're going to come to the right decision. Because the right decision is not always to uh, get the mine into operation. Mm -hmm. And we have a, a couple of examples: Pascualama. Uh, a project for Beric in the border of Argentina and Chile in a pristine uh, region of the Andes. And 
I think uh, a few months ago, finally, the Supreme Court of, Ch uh, Court of Chile just said the project is dead for good. <laughs> so the Supreme Court order that project can never happen in Chilean soil. Now, they still have the Argentinian side, but you know, if you can get the, uh, the message, wow, you know, the Supreme Court of, of Chile is saying, you know, that uh, project is not going. So what are the probabilities that it will go on the Argentinian side? So, you know, that's, a, that's an example of uh, where uh, communities and even the, uh, the legal powers uh, <clears throat> take the initiative to determine if a project is good or is convenient for the society at, at this time, because we can always talk about time, because sometimes uh, we don't have the technology, we don't have the way to do it in a feasible or, or sustainable way. If you don't mind me asking, have you ever had a community, um, just a local community or, or something, the powers of be just say it's, it's, it's time to go? Have you ever been in those situations? I mean, I know there's the stories up there. I mean, they made movies about it. Um, where the community or politically it just gets it just gets to a point I mean I know you've worked all over the world so I'm, I'm sort of interested if you know some of these crazy stories are you allowed to tell any of them yeah I, I'm allowed to tell them <laughs> some, some of that. because they, they they're a story that has uh, it happened to me like yeah. uh, I, I was running to preserve my neck sometimes because <laughs> if I stay there I could be uh, you know in, 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 in better harm's way <laughs> And um, uh, one, one example was uh, the Conga project and the, uh, the Cerro Killish, which is hardly mentioned, but you know, Cerro Killish, there was, uh, uh, it was a Newman project in, uh, in Cajamarca and uh, it get politicized. There was a lot of, and there was a lot of, uh, uh, of strikes of the population, uh, the, the politicians kind of uh, manipulated in a way the, the process. So it got pretty nasty. And uh, I, I uploaded a few pictures in there about some of the, uh, you know, the air force uh, landing in the Camarca airport uh, to uh, evacuate all the expat. That was uh, November, 2011. And, uh, uh, the population uh, in the streets, uh, you know, on uh, on general strikes, and uh, I remember that I was trying to leave. I, I was not with Newman at that time. I have just left Newman, and I was trying to to leave uh, the country. I couldn't. I uh, when I got to the airport, the airport was uh, taken by the uh, special forces, <laughs> and I had to do a. a, a a, a good Samaritan act. There was uh, an American there from uh, South Dakota, and he was charging against the uh, the military because he wanted to go into the airport, and he didn't understand what was happening. He didn't speak Spanish or anything like that. It was a retiree and stuff. So I kind of uh, you know growling and tell, hey, hey, hold on, hold on, you know, come with me. And I took him home. <laughs> And, and uh, we had lunch at home and I explained it. What was it? Hey, no, this is different. This is a different culture. You can't do that. You cannot, you know, charge against the, uh, the police. They are uh, courting the, uh, the airport because there's no flights in and out. The only things they have is military flights at this point. So uh, we, we had to go through the, uh, the bushes uh, to get back home because all the roads were, uh, uh, blockade and stuff, and uh, uh, they they throw stones to our car and all that kind of stuff. But uh, we finally made it home, <laughs> safe and sound. What's you know? There's probably a lot of questions I could ask about what's happening when all that. What what is going through your mind when all that is happening? But what's going through your mind when it's over? When you're back home, <laughs> safe and sound. <laughs> What what is the you know the next morning you wake up and you're having breakfast and sort of recalibrating all that that's gone right. on. What what what's going through your mind? Well, the night before you have a good pisco sour so you can sleep, <laughs> <laughs> and the day after, yes, you go through and say, "Wow, 
It was close. <laughs> it was a close call. <laughs> yeah. So, but you know, the good thing is, and that's something that you always have to have into account. You have to have the right people. And at that that day, we had the right driver. And it was a, you know, a taxi that we trusted. And that person know every well, he knew the community and everything. And he managed to drive us through safety. So it's very important for you to make sure that you have the right people yeah. in your team. Okay. So yeah. actually that's, that's, it, that's the most important thing. You know, it's actually funny that you said you said about the right people, because one of the thoughts that came to my mind, you know, talking to you and, and I've talked to you off camera, that you do have empathy. You you have a an, it's obvious you have an interest in people. Um, you know, you you have there's a certain accountability that you hold mining companies to, but yet you're still working in the industry, trying to get the mining industry ahead. You know, and it was something that came to my mind is if there was a, if I was a CEO listening to this and I can even put myself in this category. Some people naturally don't have a deep sense of empathy. They don't, they don't always connect with people at a level like someone like yourself can. Maybe it's because of their training. Maybe it's because of their personality, upbringing. There's all these different reasons. What, would you, what advice would you give? It, would it come down to get somebody that can and stay away from the front lines? Because <laughs> I know there's someone listening that goes, I, am not, I could not go into a community in Indonesia and it would just be a disaster. And again, I probably put myself in that category. I just don't know if I would have that ability to show that empathy and walk through that process. So if leadership is not like that, what's the key? Is it someone like you got the driver to get you out? Someone like you to come in the community? Is that the only way to do it? Well, uh, it's not the only way, but you know, if you're a leader, if you're the leader, you have to lead, you have to show. Um, I think there was a, a, a leadership system uh, uh, from DuPont, uh, uh, maybe 20 years ago, the, the felt uh, system. And it says, if you're going to be the CEO, you have to be there. You have to be in contact with your people. You have to be in contact with your stakeholder. You need to do it. But the problem, and, you know, there's some people that have it and some people that don't, don't, is arrogance. Unfortunately, we as miners, we can move mountains, we can build things incredible and stuff like that. And you can't stop getting certain arrogance with that because you're you're so mighty, you can do so many things that you know, wow, this is you you feel like Superman, eh? But you need to accompany that is that balance, eh? That balance, the yin and the yang that you have to have. Uh, you may feel powerful and great, but you have to have that humility, you know, that uh, there are things that are beyond your capabilities. And if you don't understand that, you need to make sure that you get the right uh, people, the right team, and you have to be open to listen to, uh, let's say, uh, honest feedback. And some of the issues is that some people don't like to hear what they don't agree with or that right. it, you know, it produces a cognitive di dissonance uh, in you sometimes. If I tell you something that is very much against what you believe, you're going to certainly going to reject it. Yeah. And some CEOs, I have seen that in uh, strategic planning meetings and stuff like that, they just refuse to listen <laughs> and I have been in the position a couple of times having to tell them you know you know uh, why why don't we take uh, a, a longer term approach like a five year we need to understand better this community we need to go in and uh, find out what are the issues and, and sometimes what happened is uh, uh, you probably have heard uh, saying that uh, you put a lock after somebody robbed you no, and, and that's what happens sometimes in, in the mining industry. You you go and you um, you made a mistake, and then you're trying to to do the studies and stuff. But then it's sometimes too late because right. more you fail the first time, or, or, or you uh, let's say uh, embarrass or uh, um, uh, damage the community relations and the trust. 
oof, it's it's almost impossible to recover. Mm. This is uh, Bertrand. I again, I'm going to try to ask this question, and I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of of an executive that would be trying talking to you, trying to make these decisions. If it, if you are. Uh, maybe I'll even go back to chess to try to use my ex example. <laughs> um, if you, is it easier to have empathy and work with a community and plan better if you have the tools in place? In the, in, in the way I mean, like in chess, there's all these creative moves, but you need to be things like protecting your pieces, like just basic stuff that you just need to do. If you don't do that, all the creativity will just will just fall yeah. apart. Yeah. Is like you can even have good intentions. You could be a leader with a ton of empathy, but if you don't have the right tools, it'll still fall apart. Is that when you're coming in, are you continuously trying to find all these balances it, as a leader, as, as an executives? Are they and again, I'm kind of butchering this question. I know what I'm asking, but I can't quite put it all together is how do these leaders, how do they put it all together? They've got to show empathy, but they've got to have a strategy. Um, they've also got to answer to their shareholders. Like, you know, it's easy to say, oh, you know, they're, they're doing this wrong and this wrong, but they're in a very tough position. How, yeah. where do you start with them when you're talking to them? Where, where, where does the conversation even begin? Yeah, well, I, you, you uh, nail it right, you know, we have, a, in chess, we have a lot of playbooks. You need to understand your openings, okay? Because that's going to save you a lot of time. So in community relations, it's very much the same. In your opening, you have to follow your playbook. You have to, you know, those, mm. uh, let's say, uh, openings have been studied tremendously. So if you don't know them, you're going to, you know, have to reinvent the... Uh, they will every time you, you play chess, okay? So the same with a CEO, if you don't use, you know, you don't have to know it yourself, but you have to have the people, the team that really understand and, and can do it. You have to, uh, let's say, hire the right consultants, uh, hire the right employees that knows and understand these kind of things. And you have to have a diverse and inclusive team I know nowadays everybody talk about this, but it is really important in terms of communities. You need to understand and bring people from different angles and you're gonna find all kinds of uh, elements in the community and, and you need to deal with them. So you need your playbook and you need to the right people to execute that, that playbook in, in that process. And unfortunately, nowadays it, it's really hard because, um, I think we do uh, we don't do enough to to promote the mining industry and, and you know I can tell you I have uh, true love for the mining industry I, I started uh, in mining in the early 90s 91 something like that and uh, I I found a passion for for the people for the processes you know surface mining underground mining uh, smelters <laughs> mills. Uh, the people working in there and making sure that we have the resources that we need to progress in life. You know, civilization is built on, on mining and we don't have to convince anyone, uh, convince anyone of the importance of mining. But unfortunately, one of the issues we have in mining is we're very bad at communicating. Mm. And sometimes when we have good people communicating, we we commit atrocities <laughs> and let them go because we don't like mm. all that information that sometimes exposes us and, and is a, a, a combination of, of sometimes our own arrogance, our own pride, you know, as huge miners, big captains or great superintendents and stuff like that, that we are. And, you know, somebody telling us straight through the, into our face, we say, hey, but that's it. We, we are not perfect. We're not perfect uh, beings. We need, that's why we work much better when we have a good team, a good organization to do a thing. 
I'm going to completely uh, ch change gears on you, but I don't think completely actually, um, partially change gears on you, Bertrand, is we've talked a lot about teams. You have the right people and communication skills. Um, so I'd say talking two years ago, that would be a different conversation than it is today because we are doing it virtually. People are working virtually. Leaders are leading virtually. It is a different world that we live in now. I mean, that we've literally been through a global shutdown and we're still going through it. Now we've got this interesting dynamic where in Texas, they just put 38,000 people in a stadium, um, you know, and we, we don't have anybody in the stadium. So there's all this stuff that's happening. You've worked in HR, you've worked in communities, you've worked with major mining companies. I mean, you, I mean, you've studied psychology. You, you, what is your perception of the effects. And I don't just want to talk about, because a lot of leaders do watch this show, not just the effects of people on their teams, but on the leaders themselves. What is your perception of the effects and, and what needs to, how we need to be approaching? You no, know, now, now that this is not two months anymore, this is, we're into a year now. It's, it's becoming almost a new normal. Yes. A little bit over a year now. Wow. You don't like that term, by the way, but, but no, I just said it. but, but, um, what are your thoughts? What I, I I'll let you kick off on that. Uh, what are your thoughts on it? Right. Well, uh, you know, these uh, this process uh, has been incredible, incredible, and uh, definitely uh, you have both huge challenges and incredible opportunities. And uh, the challenges for like the leadership is that they are used. To command and control from their offices okay so you you can go downtown toronto and you're going to find all kinds of uh buildings and stuff for 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 different companies where it's it's built around that everything in there right. so uh this new normal of uh, working from home has uh forced an incredible decentralization of things and now the uh, the mechanism of controls that we're used to use are, are different. So that creates a different kind of stress in us because we don't have the same kind of handy control that we can do a quick call, come up here and, and then I can use all my uh, my personal things to influence and communicate Right. Cool. Okay, so now we're trying to, to make changes. We're trying to use technologies, different technologies, uh, uh, Google, uh, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, computers, all these kind of new, new things to allow that. And let me tell you, it's a great opportunity. For instance, uh, for me, here trying to, to promote the mining industry, trying to create more... Uh, more tools of communications and more actual uh, networks of people, you know, this new normal is fantastic mm -hmm. because I can reach out to people in uh, New Zealand and reach out uh, to people in uh, Madagascar or uh, South America, Peru, and, so, and put them together. I have to be mindful about uh, the time zones, <laughs> definitely, but before it was the same, but we have now new technology that allow us to connect to each other in a much better way. Now, everybody is understanding that this is a, a new normal and it's a must. You need to understand this is a new skills, set of skills and competency for you to be successful in, in mining now too. So, you know, there's things that are not gonna change. You're still gonna need your, uh, your huddle and, in mining, you're going to have to, your crew going out there and mining and stuff like that. But you're going to have a new sort of uh, system that is going to be around that and creating uh, wireless networks uh, among people and allowing us to be more, more connected in a way, not only personally, and I hope that, you know, this process is going to end at some point. And we will be able to then combine the two new, the, the, the two things, you know, the, the old presence with the, the mighty 
wireless networks that are going to be able to, to help us uh, reach out to more people. And that's uh, why we're uh, pushing a lot our uh, initiative for the CIM Latin America now to make sure that we use this uh, new normal as a, a good first step to reach out to a, a, a larger audience mm. to make sure that they understand and, and, uh, and knows about the CIM and all the good things that we could do to make sure that we can have a good network of people, we have good camaraderie, and we can share much better uh, all our knowledge and our technology from north to south, east to west. So uh, this is a, a, for us, I think is a great opportunity this way. Because now you have a, you know, you have a podcast or you have a, a webinar and you can have people from all over the place. Yeah, it's, I mean, yeah, I, I will certainly not claim that this has been hard on our company. Um, <laughs> from a business <laughs> standpoint, it's been great for our company. Um, on the other hand, what about the people that are working from home? And I, I, I talked to my wife again. I should probably be careful of all these areas that I'm trying to go into. I'm <laughs> in trouble. But I, yeah. I've made, I've, uh, I'll, 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 maybe you can clean up my mess. Um, there is a, I've noticed that, and especially I'll say on social media, when I know people personally, the people that are, um, that they're, they're saying, they're basically accusing people of not being empathetic. They're that basically shaming people sometimes without using names um, and talking about all the things that are wrong the, with the world. I know those people personally, and those uh, quite often I find those people, um, from what I know of them, are actually not the kindest people um, and generally quite selfish. The people that really do need help and support are usually quite silent. Um, and because they're not venting, they're they're and sometimes they're just suffering alone, um, and it, it it makes me sad even talking about it. But I know it's a reality. Are people suffering? You know, companies like ours. Oh, we you know. So if you're sitting at home working from home, your life is miserable, and there's there's you know there's kids. You're, you're both you're both two professionals trying to work from home. I see people and there's dogs running behind them, and then there's kids crying. And they're trying to run a meeting, and very tough. Are there people that are suffering in your, from what you know, are there people that are suffering in silence on this that, that really, maybe it's good from a business standpoint, but I mean, there, I saw a thing you wrote uh, that I didn't even know this cabin fever or mountain madness is a real thing. I didn't actually yes. know it was. Can you talk a little bit about that? Cause I think, I think it's important. Absolutely. And uh, as I said, you know, there's a lot of challenges as, this new reality I brought to a lot of people that are not used to this. And uh, as you mentioned, you know, um, working from home for, ex for extended periods of time can give you cabin fever or mountain madness. Uh, and this is something that had been studied since uh, uh, the early 1900s uh, by a psychologist in the, in the Twin Cities in Minneapolis. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it has a lot of uh, uh, very uh, specific signs that you can look. And there's a lot of people that are suffering this. And uh, if you believe in your polling, and, you know, polling is kind of uh, part of uh, the new day-to-day -day things, you need to be making sure that you understand that. But uh, in the midst of this process, uh, probably, uh, let's say, uh, mid to three quarters of the year last, uh, <clears throat> uh, there was a, a polling day uh, made by uh, McLean and Company. Uh, and uh, they found out that about 58% of all the people have indicated that they have been very affected by having to work from home. 58%, very highly affected. So that's kind of the extreme. Mm. So only like 15% said that they were not affected at all. So what, what it, now again, and I, I think it's an important for people that are watching and a lot of, and a lot of people are watching, I know it's from home. So 
what are I mean, what are some of the symptoms? Um, do you know of some of the if someone is is actually suffering from this? Absolutely. Yeah, tiredness. <laughs> you feel a lot more tired than normal. Inability to enjoy things. Okay. Uh, struggling to keep uh, work performance. Uh, feeling physically unwell. You know, you don't feel good today. Don't want to do anything. You know. Your relationship, your relationship feels strained. You start fighting for everything. And, uh, you know, that's not good. Uh, <laughs> unable to priori prioritize, you know, your family, your breaks, you know, or take breaks. You, you start working like crazy and uh, until you're like practically uh, holding apart. Uh, insomnia, that happens depression okay uh lack of hope you don't think this is going to ever you become impatient irritable these are the kind of uh, signs that tell you that you are starting to 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 suffer having fever yeah do you have any do you have any tips for people as we sort of wrap up the you know this interview i mean that's it doesn't seem like here in canada anyway this is going to end anytime soon i know some other countries right. people contacts i have um it's it's more intense than in canada um you know i've taken up chess i've taken up biking <laughs> but <That's> yeah, <laughs> but but gaudi comes in here a couple times a day but i sent essentially uh i personally i'm in the office here by myself gaudi you're working from home um what tips do you have for people are, are there some basic things that people can do just just to take care of themselves as we try to get oh through? absolutely absolutely and this is is very important you know and uh, you mentioned a couple of them that it's uh, very important uh i can tell you a couple of the things i have done okay the first thing is you need to unplug once in a while <laughs> you need to change environment you know you need to to meditate you know uh probably get a hobby, like like you said, chess or uh, playing an instrument. Uh, look what I have here. And I said, I, I need to learn this. <laughs> the ukulele. <laughs> I'm trying to learn that, so, you I know. thought you were gonna start playing. I was like, oh, this is gonna be good. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, not yet. Maybe like, in the next show, eh? Next, next show, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but that's, a, that's a very important thing. You know, you need to get some uh, daylight and fresh air, especially now in the North Hemisphere that we are getting into the summer. This is the time to go out. Make sure you have to eat healthy, healthy food. Make sure, you know, it, it's very easy to fall into alcohol. And it's very easy to uh, smoke more than what you used to do and this kind of thing. So, you know, try to, to stay away from that. Some uh, other activities that are very important is biking. Biking is great. It's a good opportunity now. Uh, and dancing. Dancing is really, really good. Oh, no. you, know, you know that dancing is, <laughs> it's uh, first, chess is second, but dancing is first at uh, uh, preventing memory loss, Alzheimer's, all these kind of things. If you do regular dancing, you're gonna find a lot of really good things for your body and your mind. Gowdy is it's so happy right now. <laughs> Gowdy's a fan of everything you're saying, and I'm about the worst dancer. <laughs> and I always joke, I'm about I'm about six foot four. So people say, oh, people don't even notice. And I've seen six foot four <laughs> people that look like me out on a dance floor dancing, and it's noticeable <laughs> when you're bad. <laughs> Well, you know, the, you don't, don't don't be embarrassed. You know, uh, in a camp, sometimes at uh, 3,500 above sea level, yeah. you know, you usually have a very small room. And what I used to do, I put a couple of merengue music from the Dominican Republic, and I do yeah. my dancing there. You know, you didn't have a chance in the whole day, so you do it even when you're in your room at nine o'clock. <laughs> So, so they have they actually done studies on? I'm going on all, all sorts of tan, uh, tangents here, but have they actually done studies on on the on dancing? Absolutely, you can um, uh, find it in Google. Google it. Of course, it's amazing. It's amazing the the impact of dancing. But you're that. saying that it's actually it's actually studies have found that it's actually helpful with 
uh, preventing memory loss? Absolutely, yes. Oh. And I think it has to be, uh, you know, grooving and the rhythmic uh, has to do with the, the flow of uh, a blood into your brain. And the coordination that you need to do when you're dancing, that's really good for that. I think the coordination is what gets me right there. And the rhythm. I think the whole thing, actually, I really struggle with. <laughs> um, Bertrand, you know, uh, you're going to be speaking at CIM. Um, you're going to be unpacking. Did you say you're going to be unpacking more of those steps of Six Sigma? Yes, uh, absolutely. I think it's uh, May 6th. Mm -hmm. uh, is the... Uh, Six Sigma supporting corporate social responsibility. Okay, um, I think well in in at the just as we wrap up, I'm going to put links so people can connect with you on LinkedIn and that uh, just to make sure that they. But I mean, I know it'll be on CIM uh, CIM's website, but just to make sure that they catch it, I think they're going to record all these as well so people can catch them later. Um, you know, thank you for coming on the show. There's. I feel like I just skimmed the surface on a lot of your knowledge, um, but I do appreciate you walking us through, you know, some of these stories and your experience is pretty amazing. Appreciate you coming on the show. I really do hope that you come back on because I think we can unpack a lot more together. Oh, well, Jared, uh, it's been my pleasure. I, I really enjoy being able to have this uh, conversation with you and uh, trying to reach out to people and uh, to tell them a lot about the uh, the wonders of mining and all the, the good things that can happen when you uh, engage into, into mining, uh, whether uh, in a career or just as a, a su supporter of mining, because we all need mining products for developing and for the quality of life that life that we all enjoy that's actually i'm going to ask one more question <laughs> Go ahead. One. when we tell stories um there's there's a positive stories and then there's a negative stories in mining and everybody in the world and i don't think that's an exaggeration knows that negative stuff has happened in correlation with the mining industry do you think when someone like yourself comes on or mining, uh, even CEOs, if major mining CEOs and operators came on, do you think it would help the public if that transparency continues to, like a show like this, Any, you don't have to log in to watch mining now. You just can Google it and you're, it's there. Do you think that transparency will build support or do you think it will, The part of the fear is that it will people will become more anti-mining? What do you think? the results are when when there's more transparency, more public conversations uh, that people can take in? Uh, I think, uh, you know, tra transparency is never is never going to be wrong. You, you're going to be on, on the right side. You're going to be on the right side because you're telling the things the way it is. Now, if you want perfection, <laughs> uh, I always uh, tell my team, that the perfection is enemy of the good. But, you know, being transparent, being honest, you know, if you don't tell the truth, at least don't lie, okay? So you have to be transparent, you have to explain. And unfortunately, one of the things that we have had in, uh, in the history uh, in mining, there has been a lot of uh, damage. And if you look at our, um, my point seven on uh, uh, practical ways to improve relationship with the community, it says, finally, be patient. Mm. There's a lot of damage done in the past. Our record is not good. The, the process of mending things and becoming, becoming sustainable is long-term. And we in mining may have the pressure of doing things for yesterday. It is like, planting tree. The best time to do it was 20 years ago, but the second best time is now. Mm. So let's do it now. Let's do it today. Okay. If we want to start, we, we have, we want to get fruit in 20 years, we have to start now. So let's start now. Let's do it. Let's continue talking about mining. And let's not be afraid of what people can say of what had happened, what have happened, happened. Mm -hmm. Now we can only be responsible for what we do now and what we do in the future. 
I think that's a perfect way to end the, the interview, Bertrand. Thank you very much for coming on the show. And I do hope we have you back on because uh, I, I think we just scraped the surface today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jared. It's been great. Thank you, Gaudi. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, I think how, I, was just, I just looked at the time, Gaudi. I think that interview went a little longer than some of them. I think so. Good. A little bit, yeah. And I could have actually, I, I, I actually cut out some of my questions that I had for Bertrand. So <laughs> um, where can people, we're going to put lots of links and everything to connect with him. There'll be links to CIM. Please check out CIM May 3rd to 6th. Yes. Um, there is going, the amount of knowledge, and I, there is no exaggeration, the amount of knowledge that they are putting together from the industry is staggering. Gaudi, where can people follow our show, suggest guest sponsorship, what have you? All right. Well, first up, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We've got two episodes a week on there. Um, so again, subscribe so you don't miss a single episode of Mining Now, Crownsman Energy, or The Crownsman Show. Um, you can also follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn and contact us if you want to be part of any one of our shows or would like to sponsor our show's um, or know someone that should be on our show, <laughs> contact us info at crownsman.com. I like that last part of know someone because we've been getting a lot of that lately. Yeah. So thank you. And keep dancing. And that's, keep, that's, yes. and start dancing in my case. <laughs> thank you. Hey, you got to learn something. Now that I've heard that, I'm not going to be able to just ignore it. I, I, I guess I'll have to figure something out. Okay. The audience is my witness. Jared said it. <laughs> Um, and now he has to learn. <laughs> but I, I think we'll leave the performing, the ukulele with Bertrand will be better than my dancing. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Thank you, everybody. See you on the next episode of Mining Now.